whose uh, uh, democracy project has funded a lot of events and generated a lot of discussion here on campus. So of course, great thanks to him. I want to introduce and thank my great friend Tom Burke. Tom Burke, uh, traveling a long distance from Chicago to be with us, uh, braving a grand jury in uh, subpoena uh, to deliver this message on uh, on Ricardo Palmera and the situation in Colombia. So uh, I'd like to start off with everyone uh, giving a, a warm and open introduction to uh, Tom Burke. Well, let's hear it for Tom Burke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for having me come out to speak, and uh, I hope I do a good job and people uh, learn something and. Uh, you know, maybe we can have some discussion after I finish uh, with some comments. My name is Tom Burke. Um, I uh, am a Columbia Solidarity Activist. I also write for and edit articles for Fight Back newspaper. And um, in the past, I was a school custodian and a trade unionist for 14 years. I was uh, elected to the executive board of a uh, 23,000 member uh, service employees union in Chicago and uh, uh, around two th in December of 2003 I actually traveled to Columbia as a guest of the oil workers union its uh, initials are USO the oil workers union in Colombia and I went to uh, Bogota to a conference for the coca-cola workers it was a, a tribunal really to uh, investigate and expose Coca-Cola's killing of 10 trade unionists in, in Colombia. And uh, we organized a big campaign around that that uh, reached hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in this country through mostly university students who boycotted Coke and did campaigns around it. And uh, we, we brought Luis Adolfo Cardona, who was one of the workers who had been kidnapped by, by a death squad and uh, the death squad had killed his friend at the plant gates early that morning. Um, Cedro Hill was his name. And they were negotiating a union contract at the time. And uh, the company decided they would rather kill the union leaders than have a contract. And uh, a few days after uh, Luis was kidnapped, and he escaped the very same day, actually. He's uh, quite the soccer player. That's why Coca-Cola had recruited him to come work there. And uh, he's a good runner, so he got away and he ran to the police station. And when uh, when the police talked to him, they said, "Come on, we'll take you home." And uh, you know, we we don't know about your story. And when they were passing a cafe, he saw the guys who had kidnapped him uh, having drinks. You know, and the police said, "Oh, those guys wouldn't do something like that. Those guys are our friends." You know, so this this is the life of. Uh, you know, union, union organizers and workers in Colombia. So we, uh, we were able to bring Luis to the U.S. Uh, and uh, eventually won him political asylum. So he, he now is a, a union activist in Chicago and in California. And some of you may have heard of him. That's why I'm uh, introducing my talk by talking about our actual work in this country. Um, I also went to university before I became a school custodian. I attended the U University of Illinois in Urbana and also in Chicago. So that's kind of who I am. We recently have uh, been served subpoenas, 14 of us in Chicago and Michigan and Min Minneapolis. And the uh, FBI raided uh, two houses in Chicago and um, I think it's five in Min Minneapolis and also the anti-war committee office. And in those raids, they said they were trying to find uh, material support for terrorism. And uh, 20 agents raided one house in Chicago, for example. And uh, myself, I also was served a subpoena. And um, we were asked to, uh, you know, it's more than being asked, you know. It, it, we were supposed to appear in front of a grand jury in, in Chicago, and all 14 of us signed. Uh, letters with our lawyers saying we would refuse to testify and uh, I've learned a lot about grand juries in a few weeks uh, you know it's it's uh, it's kind of a, a secret process where you know there's no press allowed there's no lawyer you're, you're not allowed to have a lawyer with you 
and the U.S. prosecutors, you know, they're the ones who direct it. They choose all the jurors. Uh, there's no judge involved in the process. And when you go in that room, you're, you know, you're compelled to answer that prosecutor's questions. And if you say you don't want to, then they have to decide whether to withdraw the subpoenas, which is what they did in, in the current situation. Or they can offer people immunity, and then if you still say you don't want to testify, they put you in jail for the length of the grand jury. So that's put a lot of pressure on us. And it also means that uh, for anti-war and international solidarity activists, uh, that they're under sharp scrutiny from the FBI and the US government. And, and not just the 14 people, but in, in response to it, there was a big movement of uh, more than 60 cities held protests, and some, some were as big as 500 people in Chicago and Minneapolis. And um, so there's been a great response to that. But in terms of the talk I want to give here today, I am not allowed to talk about what I would usually talk about under the advice of lawyers. So I'm going to try to take care with what I say. Uh, uh, we're not allowed to express our opinions as we would like to. You know, our free speech is being limited by this. And it may be that uh, we have to also change the, our, the way we organize, which is, uh, you know, the right to assemble is going to be affected by this case. And just to be clear, we, we think they want to put us in jail, you know, that they're going to say that, uh, you know, because of our views and because of our organizing against war, all of us have one thing in common, uh, is we all organized against the Republican National Convention protest in Minneapolis. And uh, that's kind of one of the things that ties us all together. And, um, you know, soon after we noticed that uh, we were being asked more questions when we traveled and whatnot. So, you know, we think their goal is to kind of suppress the, the movement against war and uh, also against international solidarity and things that people are doing now, you know, in many groups across the country, they're trying to criminalize it. So, I'm a little limited in what I'm going to talk about today. The, I want to give kind of an overview about uh, U.S. war and intervention in Colombia so people have some background. I'm going to assume some people don't know a whole lot. And uh, Colombia is in the northern part of uh, the, the cone of Latin America. So, you know, below Panama and north of most of the other countries. Um, the situation is this, if, uh, if you're in the White House and you're trying to figure out foreign policy, you probably have a very difficult job because the empire that, that the U.S. has is in decline. And there's, there's a lot of problems if you're an advisor to, to, in the White House trying to keep a lid on uh, the people's movements and you know, the, the governments that are progressive in the world that are, are uh, making social change happen. And in Latin America, you know, they're facing a lot of popular movements, electoral movements, and other movements that are pushing the U.S. influence out of the region. So if you look at Venezuela with Chavez and his popularity and the government there, if you look at uh, Bolivia, which also has a progressive government, uh, you know, indigenous people have come to power through a process of both social movements and elections. The U.S. influence is being pushed out. And you can see it in things like the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia, where they train the militaries of Latin America and where many death squads and police death squads get trained. Many of these countries are, are not sending people there anymore because they know that that's where the coup makers within, within their systems arise from. You also see it economically where there's, there's uh, attempts by these governments, including like Ecuador and Brazil, to diversify, maybe people would say South-South ties instead of ties between, you know, the, the European Union and the U.S. being the primary thing. They're building ties with China, you know, with other countries in the Southern Hemisphere of the world. So there's that economic process going on. And within Latin America, there's efforts to consolidate a block economically in opposition to the U.S. economic influence and domination of the region. So it's, 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 it's a situation where the U.S. is being pushed out of the region. And um, the 
the U.S. doesn't want that. They want to dominate and rule the region, and they want their companies and corporations to be able to operate however they see fit, you know? So you, ha you have this struggle going on, and the U.S. is losing its grip. So the U.S. strategy in response to this is to make Colombia the centerpiece of their strategy, both politically, militarily, and economically. And so you see uh, the country of Colombia gets the most U.S. military aid in the hemisphere. In, in the Middle East, it would be Israel that gets the most money, and they, they play a similar role in that region in relationship to the neighboring countries. And so Colombia is ground zero for the U.S. That's where they've staked their, their place, where they're going to try to you know, prevent the changes happening in Latin America and where they don't want to retreat from it. And the U.S. faces a problem with this, which is there's, you know, a strong movement in Colombia that resists the U.S. And so the U.S. is, is making a war in Colombia. And they've spent, uh, including spending that's already been passed, about $8 billion in 10 years. That's, it was called Plan Colombia and now it seems to not really have a name anymore. But Plan Colombia was you know, dreamed up by Clinton and Gore and then carried forward by Bush. And now Obama you know, is trying to grapple with uh, how, to, how to continue you know, the US uh, presence in Colombia. So what does Plan Colombia consist of? Well, it mainly consists of military aid, but the US doesn't just send money and weapons to the Colombian military. The U.S. has command and control, meaning a southern command run out of the Pentagon that the general is in charge of what actually the war strategy is in Colombia. And so to reinforce that, there's, you know, 800 U.S. advisors, military advisors, who I've talked to, um, you know, Christian ministers who live and do human rights work in Colombia. And you know, two of them have said they have actually seen U.S. advisors with Colombian troops on the streets in towns. You know, not, not just out in the countryside, but in towns where the war is more intense. So it's, it's somewhat similar to the way advisors played a role in Vietnam. The other uh, side of U.S. personnel is that there's military contracts, what people commonly, contractors, people would commonly call mercenaries. You know, you're paid to go to war in another country. And there's 500 of those that are allowed by the, the U.S. Congress. And they play a number of roles, too, some which are you know, not, not described. But many of them fly uh, the, the chemical fumigation runs in airplanes. Many of them use uh, high-tech spy equipment from airplanes to uh, see what is happening on the ground in the countryside of Columbia. And those are kind of the two, uh, two roles for uh, mercenaries that are public. Um, so I want to talk about the, the way that the actual war gets carried out in terms of the U.S. intervention. Uh, one way is, is, again, through the chemical spraying of the countryside. And there's a well-known Colombian uh, academic named Mondragon, and uh, people should uh, look at what he writes. He, uh, he does a lot of interesting uh, analysis. But what he has found is that the chemical spraying is mostly confined to the area where there's large numbers of peasants with small holdings and where the rebels have a presence. And that the areas that are largely left alone are the large land ownings of the very, very wealthy. And uh, they grow the same crops, you know. And when I say crops, you can imagine besides, you know, food for subs sustenance, people are growing poppy and growing coca plants. And that's one of the largest agricultural exports out of the country. And there's huge, you know, drug gangs and cartels that are making a big profit out of this. Uh, it, it, it's not like a secret. In the Congress in Colombia, up to a third of the candidates are tied to the paramilitaries and to the narco traffickers, and it's it's like common knowledge and discussed in the media, you know. So it's a huge part of the economy. But where the poor peasants live, they do the chemical spraying with intensity, and they use a uh, Monsanto products. That's who gets the profits from it. 
Monsanto, uh, along with you know the companies that uh, you know the, the private military corporations that do the spraying. And it's sort of like a Roundup product, like what people spray on weeds here, but a, a much, much more exaggerated level of intensity. And when they spray it, it kills all the vegetation. It kills food crops, it kills you know, the coca plants, it kills everything. Some children have died because they'll have asthma attacks in response to the spraying. Because they, they don't come to your, uh, you know, your small, modest uh, house and say, we're gonna spray your area this week. They just come in and spray and people and animals are outside and they, they get it all over them. And the, the main effect politically, though, of the spraying is that it, re, it dislocates the, the peasants, you know, the poor farmers. And they're dislocated, at this point, there's, there's more than four million. Uh, the Venezuelan government is saying that there's, there's four to five million Colombians now living in Venezuela's border regions, you know. So with, within weeks, there's villages being set up with, uh, you know, with people who are refugees coming over from Colombia. So pe people in Venezuela are reporting four to five million Colombians living in their country now. And th I don't think that was true six years ago, you know, just to put a time frame on it. That was not my understanding, like five and six years ago. So that's a lot of displaced people that aren't being counted within Colombia. You know, but the the numbers in Colombia of displaced people are larger than the numbers of displaced people in Iraq, for example, right? Like, you know, talk about war and devastation. You know, Iraq has seen it, but Colombia is worse off in terms of these refugees. So, the the pretext that Clinton and Gore gave for, you know beginning the plan Columbia was that it was a war on drugs. But in fact, the, the, the production of poppy and coca has not, it, there's some you know, ups and downs in it, but in general it's steadily increased. And if you look at the region, it's increased. Um, at the end of the Bush uh, you know, presidency, they claimed that plan Columbia was having an effect because the price of cocaine in the US had risen, meaning there was uh, less supply coming into the U.S., so trying to claim that they were doing a good job of stopping the inflow of, of drugs. But what actually was happening is that because the euro was stronger versus the dollar, that the, the cartels were shipping more to Europe to make more profit. And so there's, there's been no impact on any level according to what the U.S. government itself says. And uh, I, you know, I encourage people to look at that and think about it. And uh, we need another approach to things, you know. The other aspect that is very important to the U.S. strategy and kind of holding the lid on the boiling pot of Colombia is death squads and paramilitaries. And under Plan Colombia, they, they ballooned the numbers of paramilitaries, you know. They, they went from thousands to like tens of thousands, you know. And... Um, Colombia in the 70s had the worst human rights record for a military in our hemisphere, right? And so the, the U.S. helped uh, the military to clean its act up by creating paramilitaries who they could run and control. And when I was in Colombia in 2003, every single week, three trade unionists were being murdered by death squads. They come out their front door, they might be murdered. Uh, they go to work, you know, 4,000 were killed in the banana fields, trade unionists, you know. And we're not talking just about leaders, you know. We're talking about workers who belong to the union and are proud of it, you know. So, you know, they would be shot dead at work, like the heat, the Cedro Hill, at the Coca-Cola plant, where, wherever they could be kind of out in the open, you know. And sometimes they would break in their homes and kill them, you know, in front of their families. So at that time, it was three a week. I went to the city of Barranca Bermeja, which you would, you would say it's like the size of, say, Milwaukee, you know? And uh, it's an oil refinery city. And um, 800 and something people were killed the year that I visited there. I, I visited in December, so they had the statistics for the end of the year. And these, these were trade unionists. There's a group called a popular feminist organization, like a women's community group. They were killed. They killed a young man who had long hair because they said he was an effeminate, you know? 
So it, it's like social cleansing as well as political. You know, anyone who's like outside what they consider a conservative norm is a target. You know, so uh, you know, could you imagine if Salt Lake City had 800 community organizers and trade unionists and student activists killed in one year? You know, it's kind of incredible. You know? So that's the type of repression that the U.S. is is uh, is funding. I want to talk about two of the kind of bigger examples of. Uh, you know, scandals, you, you know, in, in, in the Colombian military. And one was this false positive scandal that began to come out in the open about two years ago. 24 officers, including a general of the Colombian military, had to resign. The reason they had to resign is this, this is what they were doing. They would, they would take trucks to poor neighborhoods, you know, dressed in civilian clothes, and they would recruit mostly young men who were unemployed, you know, Go to the poorest area, people want jobs, say, I got a job for you out, out in this other town or out in the countryside, why don't you come with me? Uh, it's guaranteed, you know? And uh, the implication is it would be a job in, in the coca industry, you know? Uh, a lot of the processing plants exist right on the outskirts of cities, you know? And people in the government are well aware of this, you know? But that's where uh, the leaf gets converted into, you know, the product that they ship, uh, you know, to the U.S. in planes and submarines and however else they do it. So these young men would sign up and uh, go off in the trucks, and then they would be taken to the countryside and uh, they would be executed and dressed in uh, guerrilla uniforms and uh, counted as war dead. You know, and uh, most people here are younger than me. I was just a kid during the Vietnam War, but that's the kind of thing that the U.S. military did in Vietnam. They wanted body counts, you know? And how do you prove that you're winning the war? You, uh, you show dead bodies, you know? So as many as 1,300 young men were killed in a few years, you know? This, this isn't going back like 10 years. This is like, you know, a three or four year period we're talking about. And I would suspect, you know, uh, the numbers, I, I would suspect they're probably much higher, but there's 1,300 that the, the, the government is saying they can account for. And, you know, why would these officers do it? Well, one reason is they would get promotions, they would get days off, and they would get more pay for showing that they were fighting the, the guerrilla war and that they were having success. So there's all these families in urban poor areas that have lost their sons to this. So you would think uh, someone should go to jail for this, right? Well, they did go to jail for 90 days, the Colombian officers. But the, the Colombian prosecutors forgot to file the paperwork to actually prosecute them. And so they've all been released. And they're all just walking around. And uh, there, there's an important point about the Colombian justice system, which is the US funds and has an oversight uh, I'm not sure what you would call it, but the, you know they, they have like oh, advisors. You know they are advisors to the judicial system in Colombia, and um, it doesn't mean that all the judges in Colombia do what the U.S. tells them to do. But you know they're trying to establish uh, you know processes that uh, uh, you know the U.S. is a is one of the determiners of how how the court system and the prison systems work. There's also in the prison systems now U.S. advisors, and the U.S. is helping them to construct more prisons and pay for that. And so the intervention is not just military. It comes in many different forms. And it's your tax money or uh, you know, your neighbor's tax money or your, your, your family's tax money that pays for all of this. So the false positive scandal, uh, on the one hand, it's good that it was exposed, but uh, what a terrible story. And, it's our tax money that's behind it. The second one is, uh, is something that was revealed this summer. There's a, there's a Colombian military base called La Macarena. Uh, and next to this military base, uh, they found a pit of 2,000 bodies, right? And so they're not exactly sure because they have to identify the bodies. But uh, it appears that people were taken to the military base mostly social activists and rural peasant organizers. Um, 
they, uh, the bodies show signs of torture and execution. And so, you know, just like as if it was human garbage, they filled up a pit with 2,000 people, 2,000 Colombians. And there's no doubt that it's the, the uh, result of the military base next door, you know? But uh, we'll, see, we'll see if anyone gets prosecuted for that either. Again, this is, what, this is the way the war is being conducted. It's, uh, it's in the control and the command of US you know, generals and the Pentagon. And uh, they know what's going on. You know? it's, it's not a mystery to them. So the, I want to talk about the US corporations, and then we'll kind of move towards uh, Ricardo Palmera's case. I talked about Coca-Cola, and people can read about that on the internet. Um, there's also the Drum and Coal Company down in Alabama, which shut down all its operations, save uh, I think one in uh, the Appalachian areas in the U.S. And they bought up coal mines in Colombia. I think I think they ship 20, 24 million tons a year. It's an incredible amount, and they've made incredible profits from it because of the price of coal has risen like two and three times since they uh, started their, their operations. But they have, uh, they had uh, dealt with the unions there, the uh, coal miners unions, by simply killing the leaders, you know. And uh, I, I printed off uh, a declaration of uh, a guy who worked for Colombian intelligence who wasn't allowed to testify in a court case in Alabama by a Bush appointed judge. But uh, if anyone cares to read this later, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's incredible. Um, because he, uh, he was at the meetings where the paramilitary made deals with the uh, corporate leaders of the drum and coal company, the Colombian officials of the company, to kill the union leaders. You know, he was in on the conversations. He saw the... Uh, it's estimated at two hundred thousand dollars, but uh, you know, it, it, he saw the suitcase of money go, you know, to the guy who was going to go go deal with the uh, death squad. So, if anyone wants to look at that, I'll leave it right here. But what they did is they they uh, you know the coal miners go to work on buses, you know, small buses. So they uh, they stopped one of the buses with the the president and vice president of the union. They took them off the bus. They executed them right in front of everyone on the buses and dumped his body. The other guy, they uh, dragged out into the bushes, and uh, people said they heard the shots that killed him, and they found his body the next day. So the next uh, brave trade unionist steps up, and uh, he's executed as well. You know, and th you know that's that's what's happened to the union movement for you know more than 20 years now in Colombia. So it's not surprising unions only represent like 5% of workers. When I visited, they represented 8%, you know? That's just, just seven years ago. But it's steadily declining. And that's what the corporations want. They want, you know, the maximum profits, and they'll kill to do it. They'll spill the blood of whoever's in their way to get it. And they'll fund and uh, drive the, uh, the paramilitaries. So that brings me to, uh, Chiquita Banana, which is located in Cincinnati. And Chiquita is, uh, you know, a well-known company. What Chiquita did is they were running uh, the AUC, the, that's the paramilitary kind of umbrella group in Colombia. They funded them, uh, $1.7 million that they admit to over seven years. They shipped in guns from Nicaragua on banana boats to arm them. And they shipped in ammunition on those boats as well. And then they directed them to clean the Union out of the banana field. So, uh, like I said, over 4,000 people died uh, at the hands of death squads in the late 90s, you know, and early 2000s. But Chiquita is interesting for me because Eric Holder, who's the U.S. Attorney General, who's the one who uh, is in charge of the grand jury that's prosecuting us, He's the one who helped Chiquita out of their situation. And so Chiquita approached him to say, uh, you know, we've been doing wrong and we, we need to extract ourselves from it. Before they did that, they made sure that they had sold off all their holdings in Colombia. 
so they couldn't be, uh, you know, charged in court with uh, something connected to that, and they they could take those profits and invest them somewhere else. So they they knew what they were going to do, and what Holder uh, did is uh, he arranged for them to pay 25 million in a fine, uh, not to the families of the dead Colombians. That 25 million went to the U.S. government, you know, and that's what justice means in our system. There's lawyers working in Colombia to try to sue Chiquita, but nothing's come come to fruition yet. And uh, that's, you know, the popular view in Colombia is you can't get justice in Colombia, you can't get justice in the U.S. either. And so Chiquita doesn't have a single corporate official who faced a trial. There's no, you know, 4,000 dead and nobody's gone to jail for the crime. And this is a special word that I learned uh, in Colombia, impunity, you know. The state and the corporations they act with impunity. There is no law that's applied to them. They get off. Uh, they get off free. So I'm going to speak briefly about the Ricardo Palmera, uh, and uh, you know, maybe people will have things to say about that. Uh, Palmera in the court case when we went to Washington D.C., we got to hear his testimony, and we couldn't attend every day of the four trials he faced, but. Um, we learned a lot just by listening to his testimony and the testimony of uh, officials from the Colombian government and from the military and from the FBI and uh, other kind of uh, players in the court trials. Uh, Palmera was traveling through Ecuador when U.S. intelligence and Colombian intelligence seized him off the streets in Quito. And the Ecuadorian government said, uh, who at the time were very tight with the U.S. government, they said, well, you can't just arrest people in our country, you know. So they handed him over and took him back. And then they extradited him to the United States. What came out in the trials was that uh, there was a U.N. official that the U.S. wouldn't allow to testify on Palmera's behalf. And he sat in the audience, so we talked to him. What happened was he was at meetings where Palmera and the and the Colombian government made an agreement that he could have safe passage to go talk to Kofi Annan's uh, aides in the UN to try to construct and resurrect a peace process in Colombia. And instead, they you know, did, did a dirty move on him and he put up his prison in Washington, D.C. So then he faced four trials, uh, five charges on terrorism and five charges on drug charges, narco traffic charges. The first trial ended in a hung jury, and the judge, Judge Hogan, ruled that nobody was allowed to interview the jurors. Not the press, not the prosecutor, not the defense attorneys, and uh, nobody. But then he allowed the prosecutor to go interview the jury for a person, a woman. And that was clearly in violation of his own ruling. So we showed up for the beginning of the second trial, uh, we being, you know, about 17 or 18 activists from many different states across the U.S. And lo and behold, the defense made a move that the judge needed to step down from the case because uh, they were cheating, you know? Him and the prosecutor were cheating. And so we're the people that talked to the press about this because, you know, Palmera's held in solitary confinement. The press isn't allowed to interview him. So we played the role of uh, saying, well, you know, we're Americans who uh, have a right to voice our opinions, and that's what we did. And uh, the judge even talked about our right to do that, because there were man maneuvers to try to say that our protests were uh, a form of jury tampering. The, the, prosecu the prosecutor tried to enter that into the court case and even put some of our f protest flyers into the trial process. And so even at that point, you know, we started to get nervous about well, what are our rights within this? But the judge was good about clarifying, you know, they have a right to protest. And, you know, we even protested at a doorway that we thought was the main entrance, but it, it was not. Uh, the main entrance was on the other side of the building, and that's where the jurors went in. So it was very clear we were not trying to interfere with the trial, you know, um, except to express our opinions outside of it. So, um, that trial ended with that 
uh, Judge Hogan having to recuse himself, and so Judge Lambert took over. So that trial, uh, the scope of it was much limited from the first trial. Now you're, you're talking about Palmera wanted to have two witnesses. One is a woman who now lives in uh, Sweden, who's a local elected official, a politician to like a city council. And they wouldn't allow her to testify. Um, her, her life and story paralleled uh, Ricardo Palmeiras when they were doing uh, open legal political work with the Patriotic Union, which was an electoral movement. The Patriotic Union in the 1980s had 4,000 members killed by death squads over about a seven year period. So these are people running for political office, city councilors, mayors, uh, how, you know, representatives in Congress, senators, presidential and vice presidential candidates. The, the, the presidential and vice presidential candidates executed on the streets, you know? Uh, countless people, probably like many of us who would go out doing electoral work, you know, putting up flyers, going door to door. You know, 4,000 people executed who were members of that political party. When Imelda Daza Cotes, the woman who wanted to testify at Palmera's trial, came home one evening, there was a funeral wreath uh, nailed to her door. And uh, they said, we want to welcome you to your funeral. That's what it said. So she decided to, to leave. You know? She didn't think there was any other option for her. And uh, Palmera accounted that about 17 of them had started when they were in their 20s. And professionals, you know, college professors, lawyers, medical people, that they had started a group called Common Cause based on kind of um, European social democracy views, you know. And of those, uh, the only two left alive are him and Imelda, is what he testified. So that'll give you a sense of uh, what's compelling people to do the things they do. So the, the second trial ended with a conviction that Palmera it was a member of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, and that the U.S. defines that as a criminal conspiracy. Because, you know, it, it would be similar to saying the African National Congress, or the FMLN in El Salvador, or the National Liberation Front in Vietnam was a criminal conspiracy, and not a political movement, and not a liberation movement. So that's how the U.S. government defines it. Uh, other people see them differently, you know. Uh, take a note that I'm not saying what I think. Uh, I'm just telling you how the objective situation is. So, <clears throat> when he was found guilty, they said they would, uh, they would uh, rule, uh, you know, uh, that they would determine how much jail time he got at a later date. And then they proceeded towards the drug trials. And I I'll cut it short, but they got two more hung juries on the drug trials because to us, the idea of uh, drugs in that situation is the same as weapons of mass destruction. There's just no reality to it, you know? And uh, that, that's all I'm gonna say. So the U.S. lost on both of those trials. So when they sentenced him, they gave him a 60 year sentence. I think he was 57 years old at the time. He's now held in solitary confinement uh, in Colorado at the Supermax prison. You're in your cell by yourself 23 hours a day. There's no human contact. Uh, you're allowed out, but not outside. You don't see the sky, you don't breathe fresh air. You're allowed out for exercise and kind of, uh, you know, showering and whatnot for one hour a day. And, uh, you know, there's, there's no physical, no, human contact with you and anyone else. The only times we know that he has been released was to go to a, a room where there was uh, telecommunications to put him on trial in Bogota by, you know, TV screen or Skype or something, you know, like that. And he, uh, he was actually, uh, you know, prisoners are chained and cuffed by the hands and the ankles and the waist and, you know, all around. And he was also, uh, hooked up to an electronic shock machine, where if he moved too quickly or jerked, he would get shocked. And his lawyer actually protested this in a letter that uh, 
when he, you know, they're at the table, they're on trial, and he needs to reach for and look at documents, and he's under the threat of shock at any moment. So, again, this is your country, and this is what the government, which I don't think is, is your government, but this is what the government is, uh, is doing to prisoners, and uh, it's wrong, and it violates their human rights. Uh, solitary confinement is a violation of people's rights, you know? So that's, uh, that's the situation for Ricardo Palmera today. Um, so let me end by saying, uh, what's the situation for the U.S. and Colombia today? Um, you know, the Obama administration uh, was going to build seven new military bases in Colombia. And this uh, raised the hackles of all the neighboring countries. Venezuela moved a lot of troops to the border because they said, if there's going to be an official U.S. military presence, we're going to defend our, our borders, you know? And um, in response, I think, I think probably under, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm speculating, but it could be under pressure from Obama's administration. The Constitutional Court in Colombia ruled that the, the process for establishing those bases violated the Colombian Constitution. Now, there's lots of other things like extradition that violate the Colombian Constitution that they don't rule against, you know? So I'm a suspicious person thinking, well, there must be uh, something going on between the U.S. and Colombia that they, they don't want to continue this, uh, these seven new U.S. bases. You know, they had already started spending money on what they call refurbishing, you know, in other words, uh, making the bases uh, fit for U.S. Uh, jets to land at, you know, bigger planes and more troops. So it would have taken the cap of 800 you know, U.S. advisors off, and the, the number of troops in the country would have risen uh, as well. So I think, though, that they had to withdraw the bases in one sense because of the response from the neighboring countries, as well as from you know, growing protest movements in Colombia, in the countries around Colombia, and in the U.S. and Canada against further U.S. wars like Iraq and Afghanistan. People have had enough of those wars and want to bring them to an end. They want the U.S. to be good neighbors with other countries instead of making war and occupying those countries. So the U.S. bases are at this point shelled and it doesn't, I don't think they're going to come back soon, but you never know. Uh, the Colombian Congress actually probably would vote to reinstate them if uh, the current President Santos decided they wanted to, but he hasn't made any moves. The other thing is the U.S. continues to rely on high-tech weapons, you know, when, they, when they've attacked, uh, you know, uh, leaders of the movement in Colombia. You know, they recently killed one with 25 missiles, you know, to target and kill 25 people. You know, it's, it's, it's a tremendously high-tech war from the U.S. side. They're going to continue with the death squads, you know. They're, they're going to try to... Uh, do it in ways that aren't so obvious, like these false positives or pits filled with 2,000 dead bodies, you know? But I guarantee you the dirty war is going to continue. They're also, uh, you know, continuing the fumigation for now, even though it doesn't work. There's no sensible person who would argue that it works, you know? Uh, I'm sure Monsanto's happy to have the money spent, but it, it just doesn't work. When, when you fumigate, the first plant that grows back is the coca plant, you know? You can go online and look at the photos, you know? And uh, it's the first plant to grow back. It's the most hardy. So it, it just doesn't work. And then the U.S. is paying for the large, largest spy network in the history of the world in Colombia. And, and that's going to continue. So they have spies working throughout the country, you know? And uh, they don't get paid much, but there's a lot of them. And uh, it's a dangerous job to take up, too. So our view is that they're going to continue this war under Obama, and we're going to continue to organize against it. And uh, that's, that's how we, we think that we can build a big social movement to make progressive change in this country, too, by tying all these issues together. Um, lastly, I want to say we would hope that they would pursue the US and Colombian governments would pursue peace negotiations and a peace process. And uh, we understand that's not easy. Peace is not an easy thing to achieve. But it would certainly improve the lives of the people in Colombia if they took that approach. 
Um, lastly, I'll say that there's an author named James Britton, like the country Britain with two T's though. And uh, I would encourage people to look up James Britton's latest book about Columbia. And uh, it can tell you many of the things that uh, I fear to speak about these days. So I think it's a good book. Thank you for having me speak. I'll just ask people to be careful what they say, you know? So um, I thought it was interesting when you were talking about how uh, the uh, fumigation targets primarily uh, rebel controlled areas as well as uh, places with small peasant uh, land holdings. And from what I understand from uh, Britain's book, Columbia that, like, has uh, some of the most concentrated land ownership in the whole hemisphere. Um, so, I mean, do the larger land holdings, do they also grow coca as well? Like is, is, I mean, how do they justify targeting the, uh, the smaller land holdings? Uh, yes, and they, they justify it by not uh, exposing it, you know. They don't talk about it in the press, and, you know, it's really a war strategy, not a counter-drug strategy. And that's, that's what it comes down to. You said plain Columbia. What, what spelling of the word plain is it? Is it like plain and simple or? Plan, P-L-A-N. Oh, plan. Yeah, I got a Chicago accent, so. <laughs> I'll bring that up for you. Plan, all right. You know, uh, not that your average American thinks a whole lot about Columbia at all, but when it does come up, it seems like your average American characterizes the conflict going on as a, as a matter of drug trafficking and uh, terrorist actions by groups like the FARC. Could you address maybe more political realities in that? Well, you know, the, the roots of the conflict go back, uh, you know, many decades. And uh, there was a period of violencia, the violence period, that uh, came after World War II. Uh, progressive, uh, a progressive president was uh, shot, assassinated. And it led to a, a civil war where the conservatives and the liberals went to war against each other. And aligning themselves with the liberals were the Communist Party and other kind of leftist and, you know, workers and peasants movements, you know, that, uh, that were radical. And, uh, you know, that conflict killed up to a half a million people, you know. The, the, you know, there's different numbers put out, but up to half a million people died in the, in the 50s due to that conflict. And it's out of that that the, the movements continued, you know? And movements, uh, movements have their ups and downs or ebbs and flows, but, uh, you know, in the countryside you had, you know, masses of poor farmers and peasants who, you know, were organizing themselves into com autonomous communities. And even the idea of autonomous republics came up that would actually divide Colombia up into smaller countries, but, um, you know, that was an idea that's time has passed, too. So the, the Civil War is as old as I am. It's, it's older, actually. And, uh, you know, it's, it has similarities to other, other, you know, conflicts in other Latin American countries where you've had a small oligarchy, you know, with uh, you know maybe a few dozen ruling families that are extremely rich and powerful, and then you have the masses of people in the in the cities, and then even more in the countryside. So the uh, the, the conflict exists because of class, and you know there's peasants and workers, and and then there's small rich elite that the U.S. is backing up with weapons and. Black Hawk helicopters and missiles and satellites and you know chemical fumigation and death squads. You know the U.S. is on the wrong side. They're they're not on the side of the people. Um, if Ricardo Palmeira was uh, released, how much would that affect change in the issue? The, what's the issue, please? Um, just I mean just the relationship between the U.S. You, you know, some of the, uh, there's, there's a Senator Piedad Cordoba who, she's tried to pursue peace processes and talk, talk with uh, the U.S. government 
she has talked with the U.S. government. She attended the trials of Ricardo Palmera, and she's also tried to talk with uh, other governments in the region as well as with her, her own government. And, um, she was recently uh, removed from office, and she won't be allowed to be part of uh, political life for, I think, at least 18 years. And Piedad Cordoba, who, uh, you know, she, she would represent like a loyal opposition within the Colombian government, you know. Um, she's a reformer. But they couldn't even stand to have her talking with the, the Ricardo Palmeiras uh, group. And, uh, you know, they, there's no avenues that are open to having a peace process right now. And it seems like they're closing those avenues, you know. And really, if, you know, uh, if, if the loyal opposition in the Senate is disbarred, you know, from, you know, being in office, I, I think there's a closing that's happening. And I think the repression of our voices here and our movement here is also a part of that closing, you know. They, they want no resistance and they want no opposition and they don't want a voice that says, Hold on a minute, you know, this war is wrong, there's another path. Peace negotiations could be a path to social change, you know, but they don't want that. So they're actually turning up the heat on the boiling pot, you know, and eventually, uh, you know, what will happen to the lid on the pot? Um, you mentioned uh, Coke, Chiquita, and Monsanto. Are there any other type of foreign interests, be it U.S. or be it European interests that are influencing politics in uh, Colombia? There are. There's, uh, you know, there's big oil. Um, there's uh, Occidental. Um, there's there's emeralds and diamond mines in Colombia. Uh, I'll tell you. Besides bananas, something you could see uh, at the local store. There's the flower industry. You know, and uh, efforts to organize unions amongst small, mostly amongst women workers, in uh, you know the hot house flower industry. They're attacked and repressed as well. You know. Religious groups in the U.S. were recently touring a woman who was under death threat for trying to organize a union. So there's a, there's, there's a lot of extraction of raw materials industries. There's not a lot of industrial development happening in Colombia. You know, there's not like big industrial areas like many other countries, you know. And if you look at the economic plan for the country, you know, in other countries, they're grappling with how to how to domestically develop industries, you know, like uh, metal industries in Venezuela next door, or you know, change the agricultural industries in Bolivia away from drugs. The governments and you know companies that are domestic are trying to grapple with how to do that uh, with some success, you know. But in Colombia, there's no motion towards that because the oligarchy. <coughs> You know, the families that rule the country, they have no interest in play, playing with, uh, you know, the profit-making industries they have, you know. And, uh, you know, you can imagine how much drug profits there are, you know. But uh, just to say, the biggest drug profits are in the U.S. That's where the biggest chunk of profits gets taken out of uh, the whole narco-trafficking scheme, you know. It's, it's rich people in the U.S. who make the most profit from drugs. Yeah, um, with the recent WikiLeaks, uh, so, uh, WikiLeaks sort of uh, revelations that's going on in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, it seems like there's a lot of talk of this Leahy piece of legislation which permits us to not uh, fund that. Do you think that that would apply to Colombia? To and not fund what? Sorry. It, to not fund, say, like those other military organizations or something along this. I mean, are, are you familiar with it at all? Or I am. Could you maybe speak to that? Yeah, the problem is they don't enforce it, you know? Like, uh, the, it's like a patchwork thing. The, the problem is the U.S. intervention, right? And the U.S. are the ones making the war happen. And the U.S., in concert with the Colombian government, are the ones shutting down any af avenues to, to uh, peace processes, you know? And w when, when a country starts kicking out popular senators out of the government, you know, because they have a, a voice that doesn't fit the, you know, the, the administration's voice, you know, you're really seeing the closing of the parameters of political discussion and what people can do. 
And so the problem with the, the, the US Congress is the human rights reports come in, they look the other way, they make exceptions, and then they fund it. And okay, you shut down the funding to this military base, and you move it to another part of the country to do the same exact program, you know? The, the false positive scandal, you know, that's only three years ago, you know? Now you have 2,000 dead people in a pit next to another military base. You know, what's the, you know, did the funding from this group of military now end up with this one? I don't, you know, the, the problem is the big picture, not the piecemeal, oh, you've behaved badly, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make you resign from the military, we'll uh, let you out of jail with the, you know, all the freedoms of everyone else in 90 days and give you jobs with military and police contracting companies at a higher salary than you made in the military. And uh, you know we just will shut down this and open up a new one. That's what the US strategy does. It's, it's completely ineffective. Congress is a death squad Congress, you know? So. Anyone else? Other, uh, other views, maybe? We're from Colombia, and we lived there for 18 years. How do you know the situation? And before it was like that, it was very dangerous. It was a lot of kidnapping, murders. But now I think it, it has changed a little bit now. Like before, we kind of we couldn't travel around the country. It was kind of dangerous. Now we can travel around the country. We can do things that before it was difficult for us. But I think the situation has changed. They have like eliminate some of the heads of FARC. So now it's, it's still a lot of corruption, but it's not that dangerous now. The country is, I think it's getting better, little by little. I, I think it depends who you are and where you live in Colombia. Yeah, I, I, I agree for the middle classes in the cities, and especially for the upper classes, uh, whether they're in the city or the countryside, <coughs> life has improved and is less dangerous. But I think, you know, for those four or five million people displaced peasants who now live, you know, on, they're on the move, you know, they're not, they don't have stable lives, their children don't have education, they don't have health care that's stable, you know, they have to search hard for health care. You know, those people's lives are uh, in very difficult times. And then if you, uh, if you look at the actual war reports that come out, I actually would argue the war has intensified and there's more um, military and police being killed now than there was 10 years ago. And I also think uh, it's probably true for peasants and for the rebels that you know, the war is very much more intensified for them. So I think it depends who you are, you know. So. Uh, Do you think this will continue? Like, <laughs> you know, I like to be optimistic, and you know, I, I I would welcome that there would be some process to to move towards you know a peace process and move towards a system. You know, we can look at peace processes like in South Africa or Ireland or uh, El Salvador. You know, where the war was actually brought to an end because all the you know the antagonists in the war sat down and talked and kind of built a process, you know. Not to say they all agreed, right? But they built a process to end the wars. And, you know, I don't see any movement towards that now. I just see a hardening by the U.S. to pursue. It seems like the U.S. thinks they can win the war. And I don't believe that. I, I think that, uh, I think that the, the the war can continue for decades. It's, uh, you know, it's, I'm 46, it, it's 46 years old, you know? And that's a long time, you know, that's two and three generations. So I, I wanna be an optimistic person, but uh, I think that the, uh, the US government has a lot of say and that patriotic Colombians should think about how to, how to move their country out of the war and they, to do that, they have to, they have to say to the U.S., we want the U.S. to end its control and domination of both the war and the general situation. So I think, I think Colombians can change it and bring peace to Colombia, you know, even more so than 
activists in the U.S. can do it. You know, we have a we should do it too. You know, it's really our responsibility to try to bring peace to the the rest of the world. And uh, the reason why is because our government's often the one making the wars. You know, you know, you look at the the failure of the war by the U.S. in Afghanistan. You know. Now they're finally having secret talks with the Taliban. It's being reported in the paper this week. You know, the people they say are the arch terrorists of the world, they're sitting down and talking to them. And why is that? Well, because the US is losing and they need to find a way out. You know, maybe they can uh, talk and the US can talk in Colombia or promote that the government talk and make negotiations, but not just the government, you know, they should have unions and churches and community groups and political parties, all part of a process. And I don't think it's easy, but it can be done. You know? uh, in the back again, and then I'll ask you. Oh, sorry. Friend. Um, so uh, you mentioned, you compared uh, Colombia's situation to that of Israel earlier. And there's sort of this tripartite of imperialist powers going around. I mean, there's other ones outside of this too. But um, like Israel, Colombia, the United States, I was wondering if you could comment maybe on why you're, how you see Robbie fitting into the investigation of the, the Gaza Flotilla massacre that happened this year. Like he was headed up to uh, investigate that. It was so sort of how it's third. Uribe? Yeah, Robbie. Uribe. Uh, investigating the flotilla? Yes. Oh, it's an outrage that he would investigate anything. Right. You know? Uh, <laughs> it, you know, Uribe is the, the death squad president, you know? And, uh, you know, Israeli special forces have uh, trained people in Colombia in death squads, you know. And uh, if you go and, you know, when I went to the oil refinery for a protest at 6 in the morning, there were 5,000 oil workers outside the refinery to protest the free trade agreement that was being proposed by the U.S. And this is at the Ecopetrol, the, the national oil company, which, which uh, workers and unions in the 1950s uh, were able to maneuver and create enough pressure for the Colombian government to create a national oil company, you know, that they wanted the patrimony, the, the profits from the national oil company to go towards social projects of schools, health care, you, know, you know, good government that uh, would help small businesses and uh, build community, you know? And uh, it did that in some ways, you know? Like, the, on the one hand, the unions are under intense attack, but when you, when you have people starting work at 7 in the morning and you call a rally at 6, six o'clock, and they all show up, every worker showed up for work an hour early, that's a powerful union. That's an organized force of people who know what's in their own interest. But when we went to the gates, I walked with the the officials, you know, the, the leaders of the union to the gates. On one side, there were riot police, you know, and the workers weren't going to riot, you know, but shields and batons were out, you know. In front of us, in front of the, the actual refinery, was a row of barbed wire, and then all the soldiers in the military, and they're all carrying Galil rifles, Israeli made rifles, you know. So, you know, there's these economic ties based on war and based on military production that, you know, a large, a, a large percentage of Israel's uh, economy is based on military production. So countries like Colombia are getting funding from U.S. tax dollars and then spending it on Israeli military goods. And then they're taking, you know, Mossad and, you know, other uh, trainers from the Israeli military. And so it's not surprising that the U.S would, uh, you know, I'll say thumb their nose at the rest of the world by making sure Uribe is appointed to investigate a flotilla that clearly attacked civilians trying to, to send aid to Palestinian movements. Much like the FBI and the Justice Department are going to prosecute anti-war and solidarity activists in this country who support Palestine and support Colombian movements they want peace and justice, you know? It's all part of the same package. Things are growing more repressive, and it's because the U.S. is in decline, and they're starting to become more desperate 
and lash out. That's what's happening. And we need to build a powerful movement against it. You know? We need to build a movement for peace and justice and solidarity in response. And we can do it. We've done it before. So. Yes, sir. Do you have any uh, websites that we can go to for any organizations that are involved in the activism for Columbia? Sure. You can Google, you know, Ricardo Palmera. You'll find a website. You can go to fightbacknews.org, which is the newspaper that I write for. Um, there's the Columbia Action Network, which is columbiasolidarity.org. And please uh, spell Columbia with two O's. Americans like to spell it with a U, but uh, there's no U. C O L O. C O L O. M B I A. Solidarity.org. Anyone else, or uh, should we end it here? All right. Yeah? Um, what sort of uh, resistance movements are working against state? Um, I don't think I can answer that question. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed to talk about it anymore. Sorry to say. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, one last question. And I don't know if you maybe know enough about the specifics of the particular issue I'm going to talk about. So if you can't respond to it adequately, then just feel free to push aside my question, but recently, um, maybe about two or three years ago, there was, um, they claimed that the FARC had uh, kidnapped some people, and then after several attempts on uh, peace processes, the president of France and things like this, uh, they tried to uh, rescue these people, and they eventually they rescued them. Um, we hear a very one-sided sort of story about what goes on between, say, uh, organizations like the FARC and peace activists and things like that. Could you maybe cast a little light? Because even when that story came out, it seemed like they were trying to repress people's certain voices of people who were even being rescued about the way that the FARC were treating them and things like that. Could you maybe give some nuance to that, if you can? Well, I think if you want to, if if you want to pursue that, uh, there's there's a few different things you can look at. One is. Uh, the, the uh, Swiss ambassador at the time, uh, he felt betrayed. And you might look up what he had to say months later about that process. Um, you also might look at, uh, you know, if, especially if you read Spanish, Piedad Cordoba is talking a lot about what actually happened as opposed to what the story in the news was the day, the day of that. Uh, other than that, I don't really care to answer the question. So. Just not sure. Uh, it's a safe, safe ground for me to talk about. That, so. Anyway, I, I'll just say thank you to people for coming. Uh, I'll give a pitch that the School of the Americas is having a protest October, around October 20th and 21st in Fort Benning, Georgia. It's a, uh, it's a. Uh, you know, kind of faith-based religious protests, but there's lots of people there with all kinds of faiths and opinions, and uh, it's very interesting to see what the movement is like. Plus, it's in the South, and so you get to see like what activists in the South are like and talk with them, and uh, I think there would be some similarities between being an activist in Utah and an activist in the South. Uh, not the same, but similarities that would be interesting to talk to people about. And, um, you know, that school of the Americas is in decline, and it's another sign of where the U.S. empire is at. You know, Venezuela won't send anyone there anymore, and uh, neither will, uh, I think, uh, Evo Morales in uh, Bolivia, and Ecuador, and maybe El Salvador, you know. So things are changing in Latin America, and we hope to be part of that wave of change. So thank you for listening to me. Tonight in the same room at Kickoff on the FBI stuff. He's
Thanks for coming out. Yeah, eight o'clock. I'm going to talk about the.